Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Twit Specials is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Twit Live Special number 246, recorded April 13th, 2015. Broadcast Minds at NAB. try and keep the fans involved in the game. There's so many different benefits. The possibilities are really endless. La creatividad que se logra y las cosas que se pueden hacer de calidad. We try to tell the best story we can, and that's all we're really worried about. It's really important to us to find ways to convey the excitement of the unknown. Audiences who can't actually make it here to the museum can follow the shows live online. It creates a, a whole expansion of the size of that event just by allowing more people to see it simultaneously. We have a different objective and that is to engage local people. Community engagement is a really important part of what we do. These guys, they want to show off to each other, they want to show what they've done. Um, we needed to capture those moments instantaneously give them those moments that they could then immediately share them with their friends. We're challenged to raise the bar, so I think we're really pushing the boundaries of what corporate television is and can be. It was kind of cool to know that thousands of people are watching something that I'm creating right now. You put a lot of hours, you put a lot of work into it, and, you know, whenever people give you that acknowledgement of job well done, you put on a good show, no better feeling than that. How are you guys doing today? All right, I'm getting heckled already. We haven't even gotten started and the heckling has begun. My name is Philip Nelson with New Tech. I'm the Chief Relationship Officer and I'm really excited to have you guys here today to join us for another Broadcast Minds panel. You know, the New Tech, I, I don't know if you guys know this uh, little piece of propaganda, but New Tech's customers, a lot of you are sitting in this room, produce over a quarter million hours of video a month. Um, and, and it is so exciting to work for a company that is, is changing the world. Um, we do have an amazing panel today, and the concept of Broadcast Minds is to bring together big thinkers who are changing the definition of what it means to be a broadcaster. And every year we have cool people come in and we talk about big things and where it's going, and, and this year we have some pretty studly panelists. I'm going to go ahead and jump right in and start with introducing our moderator, Mr. Leo Laporte. He's known as the godfather of tech broadcasting. He was a pioneer um, with tech TVs in the show The Screensaver. He's also the tech guy on a nationally syndicated radio show. And he has a very cool title. He is the chief twit at twit.tv. And they're producing over 40 hours of live content every week. Let's hear it for Mr. Leo Laporte. And I'm proud to announce his hair has grown back after his little stunt raising some money. So. Welcome, Leo. Hi, Philip. The best dressed man in the room right now. <laughs> Bow ties are back, baby. <laughs> All right, so Leo is going to be moderating for us. So let's go ahead and get to introducing our panel. Mark Debevoise is the EVP and GM of Entertainment, News, and Sports for CBS Interactive, and he runs the digital arm for CBS, which is the number one television network in America. They are the largest premium content network on the internet. They have over 300 million unique monthlies, 140,000 of those are domestic, or 140 million are domestic. And they've recently launched CBS All Access, which is a direct-to-viewer product, along with a 24-7 CBSN live news streaming. 
They're definitely stirring up the industry. Help me welcome Mark Debevoise. All right, our next panelist, once again, all these people are disruptive. And I was sitting in the uh, green room backstage, and they're they disruptive, so disruptive even backstage, oh, right? My, yeah. <laughs> all right, so uh, our next panelist is Sterling Proffer, head of digital strategy for Vice.com. They are the largest media outlet for millennials. They started 20 years ago as a print organization. They moved to online, and in 2006, they added video. And now they're moving into television with a deal they just signed with HBO. Um, as we said, we have these disruptive people. Help me welcome Sterling Proffer of Vice.com. All right, our final panelist for today is known as the Scobalizer. Robert Scoble, he's got a great title too. He's a futurist at Rackspace. He spends his life traveling the world and studying innovators. He's known to many, as I said, as the Scobalizer, and he has some pretty impressive social media statistics. 6.7 million Google Plus followers, 450,000 Twitter followers, uh, 670,000 Facebook followers, and he's one of the first people to create video on the internet from within inside a company when he was at Microsoft. So help me welcome the Scobalizer, Robert Scoble. And he's carrying his <laughs> Thor's hammer. But anyway, Leo, take it away. All right. Hey, thank you, Philip. Thank you for being here, everybody. And thanks to our panelists. It's a great uh, panel. And you know, it's really fun for me to walk through NAB every year and see how broadcasting is changing. And I, I'm wondering maybe if you guys could characterize it from your point of view. What is what is happening in broadcasting? What are the big issues going on? Why don't, why don't you start, Mark? Since you come from a traditional broadcaster. We've got guys walking around with, you know, that's weird. six headed cameras. We should explain what we that is. That's, Futurist. That is a six GoPros, and it's designed to do what? Uh, do 360 video for something like the Oculus Rift, but YouTube just turned on the ability to scroll around. So if I was recording this on, on stage right now, the viewer could decide who to, they're going to look at. We could explain, too, that Robert just got back from Coachella. He's had three hours sleep. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't even taken off my glasses yet. And you can see the GoPro video at the GoPro booth, the video well, you shot at Coachella. They're processing it right now. Okay. Yeah. So they're, are they going to put it up, or are they just going to show it at the booth? I don't know. We'll yeah. See. I'm sure we're going to put some of it up. Uh, it might take me a, a week to edit it and stuff like that. Is that part of what's changing broadcasting, Mark? Maybe. Maybe. We don't know yet. We were talking about it. It's not really consumer ready, I think, yet. It's coming. Uh, when everybody's wearing goggles instead of staring at us with their eyeballs, maybe we'll be there. But uh, still needs a distribution mechanism. And actually, I think that's one of the big things that's changing in broadcast. It's really, uh, you know, great content is still great content. And when you can create it, you're going to be in, in great shape. I think that's true of a couple, you know, a couple of us here on the, on the panel. But I think what's really changing is how you distribute it and how you put it out and get it to consumers. And I think, you know, I look at it as sort of three big trends that have shaped where we are. One is... Connectivity is now universal. Essentially, have 80% of homes with a broadband connection that can deliver robust video in a, a very you know clean and, and good way. Uh, you have device proliferation that's absolutely massive, right? It, who doesn't have a smartphone? I have like nine people filming me right here, right. The, or they were filming him. We were on Meerkat. Everybody, yeah. uh, we got 80 Meerkats. How many stuff. people know about what Meerkat is? That's Pretty good, good number. Good. Yeah. Can we take a quick vote? Meerkat versus Periscope. Who's on Team Meerkat? No one. Who's on uh, Team Periscope? Ooh. Wow. <laughs> the owners dominate. Uh, <laughs> no, and, and, I, and I think the third piece is that now that, that connected device class is going to move sort of back to the TV. You now have you know, set-top boxes that can deliver IP signals that are really you know, clean and easy to, to get onto if you have the right technology. So you put those three things together, and you're really going to see an explosion of a new form of distribution uh, that you haven't seen before. Yeah, you know, web distribution's been growing, it's been massive, but I think you're really gonna see that shift, uh, you know, continue. I think we're probably three years in, we didn't know we were three years into probably a big 10 year shift as it happens over the next, you know, next seven years. It feels like it's starting to happen. You can start seeing the uh, evidence of, of it. Uh, Sterling, you're a content guy. Do you care about distribution? Of course. We like to own as much of it as we can, and then uh, for- What do you mean own it? Well, just control it. Not in the old days, that meant you had a television tower and a transmitter and, or a printing press. Yeah. You don't mean that. 
Well, I mean, you know, you can basically rent or lease. There are all these buzzwords that you can use for how you treat, how you get your content out into the world. But uh, what you can definitely say for sure is that content owners now have a lot more control over how, when, and where it goes. And I think that um, presents a really incredible opportunity for people that uh, can actually start to think about where and how that content is consumed while they're thinking about how they make it. I mean, if you just look at Robert here with his awesome rig, I mean, he's thinking about how and where people are gonna watch this, whether it's on YouTube, whether it's on an Oculus device, whatever it may be. Um, you know, it, it starts to really inform the creative process, right? In the world of 2D TV, you know, I mean, I went to film school and day one they teach you, right? 2D the 180 TV. rule, right? <laughs> yeah. They teach you the 180, don't break that or else right. you confuse the audience. I mean, when you can look in 360 degrees, it kind of interests What does it even mean? Yeah. What does it all mean? You can't cross the line in three, 3D vid 360 yeah. video. It, it's hard to shoot with this because uh, there's no crew. <laughs> You're always in the shot, right? <laughs> so there are many broadcasters who like that idea. The the movie magic of 3D video and 360 video. It's not for Would you say Vice is an aggregator though, or what is? Vi well, I mean, we aggregate ourselves. Yeah, you we, create the content. We make a hundred percent of what we distribute. Interesting. Um, so you know, for us, uh, you know. Discovering video and discovering content of any kind is tricky enough. And oftentimes you don't necessarily know who made the video and you don't know if it's just been aggregated into some place or where the original uh, content came from. And for us, you know, we found that Vice has been consistently a breath of fresh air for our audience. They always know that they can come to us and what they see or wherever they see the Vice brand, whether it's on our website, on Facebook, on YouTube, on Instagram, on any platform, uh, social, OTT, TV, whatever, that there's gonna actually be consistency in the voice and consistency in the content that they're gonna be able to, and I actually just had uh, someone say this again the other day, which is, you know, people have said that we're one of the few content companies where you don't need to see any graphics, you don't need to see any watermarks, anything, and you can still know that it's you know a vice piece of content. Yeah. And that is really, really important for us. And as distribution becomes increasingly fragmented, exponentially fragmented, having consistency in, in, in that voice, you know, we think is really, really important. Robert, for, you're the king me, of brands. Uh, you're, you're the king of voice. You're individual brand. For me, well, uh, in terms of the show, uh, the thing for me is the drone war. Uh, D, uh, 3D Robotics just announced a new drone where you can set a cable, a virtual cable, and have the drone fly down that cable. That's pretty cool. And uh, DGI just announced a drone last week. So there's a lot of action in the drone, the aerial camera space. Coachella was using a drone, a DGI drone, over the audiences last night to shoot, shoot the concerts. You sure you didn't just imagine that? <laughs> I was it was sober. glowing. <laughs> last year I was not sober. This year I was sober. So. Um, 3D is uh, 360 videos coming. Uh, Coachella was playing with a, a couple of video cameras there that do uh, uh, wraparound video for Oculus Rift and stuff like that. Uh, but this has no distribution yet. I mean, I, uh, YouTube just started uh, distributing it two weeks ago. Facebook announced support and is supposedly going to turn it on in September. Uh, so I think this story is going to be NAB next year. There's going to be a lot of cameras that are going to come out. From what I hear, there's a a few camera companies that are working on 3D, uh, 360 cameras for next year, uh, and that'll be the show theme next year. But I think this year is uh, drones. You know, if you're in the consumer space, in terms of uh, you know, f 4K is starting to become real. I think in terms of screen. But Robert, you and I are technologists, so we're kind of fascinated by technology, maybe oh, yeah. to an excess. Uh, it sounds like you know, Sterling's saying content is king. Um, Mark, you are part of your job is to bring content to new technologies. How much do you pay attention to technology? How much do you pay attention to content? Well, I mean, I, I think of it as content is king, distribution's queen, yeah. and and essentially, technology should be the I don't know the servant in between. Maybe that's a bad way to say it, but the 
the place that can get you from from content to distribution, right? Do you, are you looking at different new technologies, thinking how do we apply this to what we do? Or? Absolutely. I mean, I think what impacts us more, you know, I mean, you know, camera technology will evolve to the point at which it can be used to shoot some of the content, and then therefore the creators can use it. But I certainly have creators at this point saying, I want to put a GoPro on my set, or I want to put a GoPro here. They refer to it as a GoPro first of all, instead of as a camera, which is that's that's like Kleenex. It's the yeah, brand. It's like Q-tips. Yeah. yeah, but. Uh, you know, I think we think about more technology like, like social media and how that changed how people discover and find our programming. Uh, you know, the distribution of, of, of the new set-top boxes out there like Roku and or how Chromecast works or Apple TV or, or any of the game consoles and how those enable us to take an internet signal to the television. You know, frankly, mobile, just mobile over the last five years and the explosive growth that that is. I mean, it's just absolutely phenomenal and where everything's... Uh, you know, uh, it's now surpassed desktop, you know, if you count tablet and, and phone together in terms of consumption for us and frankly for everyone in the video space. So I think it's a, it's a means to an end, a type of distribution, but a very, you know, essential and important part of how to get there. How did it work at CBS? Did, did Les Moonves say, we got to be in this, let's go find somebody like Mark and figure out how to do it? Is that is that what happens? I mean, I, I don't I don't know how they you know I know how they found me, which is a, a guy named Xander Laurie who now runs media over at GoPro was the, was the oh that's funny CFO at CNET and got acquired and he he and I used to be bankers together, 15 20 years ago. Yeah. So I'm a recovering investment banker, um, but but you know like when when we came together about four years ago, the new group that runs CBS Interactive, we started to look at what was going to evolve, and probably about two and a half years ago, we started to say you know, we were growing and we had the division working pretty nicely, but. We said, look, there's something that's going to change here pretty big, and we have a couple of big opportunities. One in news about how do we, you know, we, we were delivering news two and a half hours a day. Meanwhile, we were creating enough news to program a full channel. Right. right? And what were, why weren't we exploiting that? Right. Well, now we have a new distribution mechanism, which was we right. could do that, and we could target it at younger audiences and use new anchors and do all kinds of things. So that's what the impetus for CBSN was, a great collaboration between our news division and Interactive to, to launch a new product there across probably seven or eight platforms on the first day. And then all access was was the was the other big you know innovation, which was you know our direct to consumer subscription product that also includes the live linear feed of your local television station, uh, your local CBS station, and that was really, you know, sort of a two year process of thinking about where our competitors had gone with Hulu Plus, had sort of had their their brands taken off it, but had gotten their content out there, and, and where we were in the TV everywhere landscape, sort of not having uh, the right deals in place with our distributors to really execute those rights. Meanwhile, knowing we could do it from a tech perspective. So we really talked about that, honestly, for a year, then started building it for about nine months, and then finally launched it. So There's a difference in yeah. speed between how fast tech moves and how fast you can move. And also, you don't want to probably move as fast as oh. technology. We have a great business. And right. You, know, you have to be... 70 to 80% of television is watched live on a TV. Is that true, really? Yes, wow. absolutely. 80% 80, 80 on CBS, 70% 70-something across the industry. And I think people fell asleep on live, you know, when the first 10 years of sort of internet video were like on demand, on demand, search, you'll figure it out, you, 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 right. you know what you want, come on. And, and <laughs> forgot the fact that like people like to be programmed to, they like to be aggregated to around a, around a brand. Percent. Yeah, and sports and news drive a lot of that, but it, it, is, it is essentially the, 70, 80%. That's a good example. With you, DVRs in place. That's how, a good example of how you can get ahead of the game by not understanding your audience. I would have assumed that most people are watching on demand now. Uh, that's amazing. That's very interesting. Uh, you did something interesting at Vice. You s did, first of all, I had no idea, and you were telling me Sterling Vice is a 21 years, started 21 years ago as a magazine. Uh, but the modern Vice really is targeted at millennials. It's targeted at younger people. Yeah. Um, Vice did start as a Gen X company. It was a bunch of 20-somethings in 1994 who were having fun. Uh, making a magazine about sex, drugs, and rock and roll. Right. And um, hence the name. Well, the name is actually a funny story. Uh, originally, the company was the Voice of Montreal, and um, for reasons that we don't need to get into, they <laughs> needed ch to uh, change their name, and so they decided to drop the O and call it Vice. <laughs> um, was that a good move or a bad move? Sometimes I think Vice sends a message. Maybe it doesn't among millennials. That I, is that what? I mean... You're stuck with it, I guess, now. We're very happy with it. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, the company uh, went online in 99, um, started a record boom. label in 2001. We've always had our, you know, our foothold, I guess, in youth culture. And 
when we went online, the audience aged down, obviously. And, uh, you know, Vice has always been, you know, Vice is not a company where we make boardroom decisions about this is the direction that we're headed, oh, and here's the gap in the market, and yeah. here's where we're going to go. It was really just a company that was built by its audience because the audience worked there. You right? had the passion for it. And yeah, and we had the passion for it. And in 2006, we started making online video. Um, and that's when the company really started to grow. And in 2009, uh, we launched the first vertical or the first new channel in the Vice family, which is called Motherboard, which is focused on science and technology. And then we just continued to grow from there. We launched Noisy, our music channel. And then 2012, we went to YouTube and we started distributing our video there. And then, you know, we had all these moments where it was kind of each moment represented a new sort of birth for the company in terms of the size of the audience that we were able to reach. Um, and really, you know, the story of Vice is the story of the evolution of technology, right? Like, it was, you know, the ability to put out a magazine that you could design on your computer, right? And then it was Final Cut. <laughs> and then it was YouTube. And right. it was all these different technologies that actually allowed people who were not technologists to leverage it in a way that, uh, that, that people who were very much content people could figure out and use to, uh, to, get a, to, to, to get out to our audience. Who's your competitor? Is it Snapchat or is it BuzzFeed? <laughs> I, mean, no, Coachella, I mean, Coachella was uh, publishing live Snapchats you know, and had a team doing that, right? Yeah, I mean, millennial. we love Snapchat. Snapchat is our friend. Um, <laughs> basically, you know, we... <sighs> I mean, the, it, it's a funny question. If you break up the Vice business, I bet half this audience doesn't even use, hasn't even tried Snapchat. Who has Snapchat installed on their phone? Yeah, a third. A third. A third. I mean, <laughs> Vice actually has uh, a partnership with Snapchat. They launched something called Discover, um, which is really nice because it's um, it's not an aggregation of everything. Right. It's a set of hand-selected partners that they worked with who are publishing to Snapchat in a way that really makes sense for the Snapchat th audience. When they launched that, it wasn't very long ago, I thought, this is really interesting because there's no way to monetize it. But then you watch yes, Katie there Couric. Oh, there is. There'll be ads in there? All right. That's coming. It's there. There's there. They're doing it now. Yeah. Uh, but you watch Katie Couric do a newscast, basically, by swiping from story to story. It made sense for a few things. For ESPN, it makes sense because you can have sports... Highlights. What's your Snapchat uh, strategy, Mark? Uh, we're talking to them. I mean, we think it's it's interesting. Our audiences aren't necessarily, you know, there's a lot of people on Snapchat, so I don't say our audiences aren't there, but uh, we're trying to figure out what the right strategy for us is uh, for each of our brands. I mean, yeah. I think for sports, it makes a lot of sense. For news, it makes a lot of sense. For it does, for the quick hit stuff. For entertainment, it's a little less right. obvious, right, of how you, like, make, you know, NCIS work for Snapchat. Right. I don't think it's going to. It doesn't make sense. Right. So we have to pick our spots right. and find the right, right areas. We certainly think Facebook and, and, and some of the sort of broader platforms have a... Have a it sounds like you platform. both are treating media the same way I, I am in the corporate world. I work for Xspace, and we're, we're on a lot of these platforms. We have a TriCaster and do professional video uh, to YouTube and other places. And it, it sounds like you're, it, the world is like that. Coachella was like that. The, they had professional 4K video cameras and crews shooting everything uh, you know, with a, uh, YouTube as a partner. Uh, live streaming all weekend long, and uh, then they had Snapchat channels going. So, is that the new world where everybody in? I feel like everybody media? wants to go out there. I, I said this on a panel earlier today. It's like they they want to go out and say, well, these things exist, and they're in the ad business, so they're going to live, and everything else is going to die, right? That exists in in ad sales. And I'm like, guys, it's like, it's not that straight. You know, these guys are, are our partners: Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, Snapchat. They're all partners for people that create content and want to distribute it to new audiences who now have these these technologies, these applications, and that's how they consume certain kinds of media, maybe shorter ones or different ones and, and different ways they do it. You have to look at how you play in it. We're all hiring teams and p people to figure it out, you know, for each type of content. Sterling, what's your sense, yeah. though, what Snapchat means to Vice? I mean, I mean it, it, it means what every gathering place for audience means, you know? I mean, it means that people find value in congregating in these places, whether it's an app or a social network or something where they're creating their own content or just consuming content. I mean, it really just comes down to what your goal is as a content creator. I don't even, I don't even want to say as a media company. I mean, 
Rackspace is a media company in that respect. I mean, yeah. every brand is a media company because yeah. they're publishing. And our customers, uh, Ted is a customer. That's a media company, really. Of course. And so, you know, I think that if your goal is to have your content reach as many people as possible, then you should think about all the different places where you can reach your audience and then just make sure that you're doing so in a way that uh, that is aware of and respectful of the sort of nuances of that community. It has to be native to that medium. It has to be native to it, I mean, because otherwise you uh, you get found out really quickly if you just You look like a jerk. Purpose. Yeah, you look like a jerk. You look like an idiot. Right. They you don't like get it. And yeah. on, on the other hand, people like me who are playing around with consumer technology, uh, I don't have a satellite truck, and I don't have a bunch of 4K uh, cameras to do professional live broadcasting of us. And neither do we, and we're a big <laughs> media company. We what, don't have any of that. What percentage of your audience watches live? <laughs> well, it depends. It I mean, ain't 80. I can almost be, be we, certain well, of we, 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 you know, I, I can't give you a stat on... Do you have live content? Are, on occasion. Okay. And that's the thing. We have live when live matters, right. right? And we program for live when live matters. I mean, when we were on the ground in Ferguson, for example, like we had incredible live coverage and it really, I mean, you know, the, it was so amazing for us to see um, essentially what looked like a documentary, like come to life and be broadcast live. Uh, and, you know, just watching uh, our hosts walk around and talking to police officers and getting a ride from the cops from one place to another and going out and seeing tear gas getting thrown out from the cops. Like We were able to do so with a rig and with a staff that is an order of magnitude smaller and cheaper than you know any traditional broadcast operation. You don't have to tell me and Robert that. We yeah. we walk around with monopods. And yeah, exactly. And it's just it's helmet it's, cams. It's, it's pretty amazing because I mean, I'll just give you a, a funny example. When we started Vice News a year ago, we came out of beta early because we were on the ground in Crimea. Um, we were putting up dispatches daily from from Ukraine, and uh, we saw a bunch of comments online that said, "You guys should also be in Venezuela." And we were like, okay, right. <laughs> so we sent another crew to Venezuela, and you know, 3G is so terrible there. And we were putting, I learned so much about like crazy cellular, you know, technology. Um, and basically, what happened is we were dealing with situations that were just so terrible. We had just launched such a bare bones staff. Our global head of content, Alex Miller, was was trying to live stream, and he was trying and trying and trying, and the signal kept cutting out. We ended up having to put together and hijack a rig where I ended up calling him on my cell phone, patching that audio from the eighth inch in my phone out into a computer, which I think, I think we then screen capped that to pull the audio and push that out to a feed. But we were able to do live, you know, over the web in a situation where basically the government was trying to shut down any live broadcast. And the fact is we could do that because we had mobile technology and we had a really killer crew who could basically, you know, duct tape together the internet. But this is something Edward R. Murrow may never have done. But is this something that, Mar I want to ask Mark this, do you think audiences are more open now to kind of guerrilla coverage and rough and ready coverage? Yeah, I mean, I, I think when we launched CBSN, our, our view was we're going to launch a very uh, professional looking uh, product, but it's certainly going to be at, at fractions of the cost of right. what it would cost to run. I mean, the, the tweet that I always use is a guy I've probably gotten this guy fired three times, so I won't use his name again, but he's a local <laughs> producer for an NBC station who tweeted out that CBSN is what MSNBC should have been. Wow. And, and I like that because it's true. It's what we thought of as like, like, where's headline news? Where's the guy that's just covering the news all day long and doing it live? And the, and the reason live matters is for things like Ferguson or when the, you know, Charlie Hebdo happens or when those, those, those things happen, you're there and you're there with staff that knows how to handle that. And, and that matters for, for people, and I think that's when people tune in. And what we see from the data, at least early, is that there, people are, first of all, watching live two to one. And we, we literally make every asset that flows through CBSN comes into a, a DVR and pops into a VOD playlist right on the left-hand side of the, of the screen. So you literally have full VOD access to the past hour instantly, and yet they're still watching the live two to right. one, right? Because they're wanting, like, what is the news? Right. I don't need to pick my news. I want to know what right. the news is. And, and when you have a live event, we see, you know, three, four, five X spikes. And so 
I mean, the, it wasn't a joke, but what we were saying is, is that, that the live is driven by what I would call mainstream, sort of serious news events that happen, and the VOD is essentially driven by pop culture, you know. There's no urgency. Bobby in Christina in the right. hospital, you know, or this or that, you know, something that is pop culture celebrity, you know, something around that nature that, that is driving the VOD views. But the, right. but the live stuff is driven by when a hard news story happens or a, a mainstream story happens, that's when you see those spikes. I think it's so funny that this panel's called Broadcast Mind because I think what you're really seeing is a complete deconstruction of what media is, of what broadcast is. It feels like technology is fragmenting it, is reinventing it. It's almost like bebop where you're taking a chord and dividing it to a bunch of notes and we don't know how it's going to fall. Do the, how does the, I mean, you have, uh, does the audience accept this is, is my question. Do they, is this what they want? Or is this what we're doing because we can? Well, you know, at Coachella, I saw a third of the people shooting this way and two thirds of the people shooting this because way. Because that's the right way. <laughs> For a mobile phone. But, Everybody you know, people me, in this makes, room think this Makes is people horrid. so angry. Horrid, right? Yeah. Because I don't want to watch vertical video on my big uh, 65. But on your TV. smartphone, you do. Yes. Yeah. It, mostly because the new things are social. It's not right. all about the video. It's about all the people who are chatting with right. you. I was doing an interview with the geek who runs Coachella on Saturday on Meerkat, and there was a th thousand people watching, and they were asking really interesting questions, making my interview better, you know? But so what do you do, I mean, uh, in a deconstructed environment where, you know, it's almost as if we threw everything up in the air and we see what happens. Uh, you, you can't go too fast because, I mean, again, your audience is, you can't drag your audience into this. I mean, I, I are they telling you what they want? I'd throw two things out there. I mean, look, we're all experimenting and that's good. And we're yep. trying to figure out what people want with new technology and new you know, devices and connectivity and all those pieces. But uh, my view is that brands are still going to matter brands that you can, you know, whether it's trust or aggregation of content you like or whatever, brands will matter. It's not just, everyone's like, oh, it's just about the show. Look, trust me, the show absolutely matters more than anything or the, the content itself. But wrapping it in an aggregated brand that people understand and can come to, I think is going to be even more important as it fragments more. Uh, That's interesting. So I go, with, I go with brand. And then I say, look, people don't change that much. I mean, I, it's funny, like, when are those peaks and valleys of news streaming? In the morning and right. in prime time. Right. When are the peaks and valleys? You know, it's like it doesn't, yeah. people's days don't change that fundamentally just because technology changed. It's like life is still life, you know. Right. You're still going around doing the same types of things. Yeah, and right. people want to just, they just want to be informed, they want to enter, be entertained, they want to have fun, and they just want that to just work in whatever mode of thinking they're in, right? But for a generation that's grown up watching YouTube as their primary television, what they don't care about brand, do they? Oh, they care about brand even more. I mean, think about the rise of the vlogger. What is a vlog? I mean, I, and I don't want to start saying things like personal brand on stage, but, you know, I mean... <laughs> as he looks at me. <laughs> <laughs> you're the master. <laughs> don't piss what, him off. Uh, He's got a nasty social following. I... <laughs> uh, <laughs> He, I mean, the, the fact is that, you know, you, people are just people. And if you are going to build a company around, well, you know what? People have voices and voices that resonate, you know, build audiences. They pull them in. And, 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 when, and when that voice, whether it's a person or a media company, is consistently delivering against some value to the audience, People say, I want more. And yeah. now, you know, the atomic choice, the a la carte nature of the social web allows you to identify and sort of self-select with who you want to follow and who you care about. And, you know, if you're someone like Robert, you know, Robert is going to be Robert on any single platform. And whether it's through text or whether it's through video or whether it's through three, uh, you know, 360 video, whatever it may be, it's always going to be him. And, you know, I'm, I'm speaking for you, of course. Yeah. But the fact of the matter but is... Right, yeah, but Robert doesn't need an overarching brand. Robert is the brand. He, doesn't he need is the brand. Yeah. But if you're going to build a company around that, and you're going to make a whole lot of content. Right. Then it's really good if the wrapper, it's really good if the handle, it's really good if the brand actually means something. And so for Vice, you know, we've built a, a, a very successful media company 
because there's integrity in the brand. There's integrity in what you're going to find. Even if there is a constellation of different things that we're going to cover, from news to sports to music to fashion to food to whatever it may be, there is that consistency that makes the Vice brand meaningful and that makes it reliable and that makes it something that the user wants to follow regardless of what platform it's on. So there's really, yeah. it's two different, we're, we're overloading the word brand because there's an individual brand like Roberts and there's a larger corporate brand like Vice or CBS. Well, is, is the corporate- mind, I, I do uh, Rackspace videos too and I, I try, I think like that. If I don't give enough value to my audience, they, they stop watching and then wh what do I got? Nothing, right? Uh, I, I try to keep the, the kinds of uh, buy rack space messages to a very, very minimum level and give the audience a lot of value for watching because if, if they don't come back and watch tomorrow, uh, I, I'm worthless. So the value of the corporate brand is monetization? Well, it's is relationships. Is it curation? It's relationships. It's, it's relationships. It's branding, right? If, if I interview uh, uh, the team that built Oculus Rift, it, my Rackspace's brand is associated with Oculus Rift all of a sudden. And right. people think that, oh, uh, Rackspace is keeping up We're today. seeing a lot of creators, though, going off on their own, having their individual name, their voice, turning their backs on the big YouTube networks, going out on their own. Is there, you know, is there, do they well, need? I mean, just for this thing, there's, uh, uh, oh God, how many, there's three, uh, three uh, th uh, video sites that you can distribute this video. Right, Nobody YouTube's one of them. them. Yep. B Radio. The problem, one. nobody even knows about them. Uh, yeah. uh, <laughs> they know Star, YouTube. Little Star. Right. Uh, is a and Facebook's going to do it. One. Facebook's coming in September. Uh, uh, YouTube is out as of two weeks ago. So even this space, this space is uh, radically changing. And, and the space of Fort, you know, of YouTube, it continues to shift a little bit here and there. So, what is the brand CBS? What is that? What is the? What is? What do you bring to the table that a, an individual creator should should be interested in that? Well, I mean, I'd, I'd besides capitalization, I right? Guess. I mean, we, we really we really don't play in the sort of you know make a show in your basement, put it on TV <laughs> space. You know, we're we're spending you know billions of dollars on programming every year. Uh, from major sporting events to news right. to, to major entertainment programming. Although so, I've had some of my pictures and video on CVS done in the basement on TV. If you have, if you have news, I, for instance, I had John uh, Edwards on a plane with his mistress. I had the only pictures. And uh, they you. were uh, on all the TV networks, and they weren't that sharp or that no, well news produced, is, right? And news is a different beast, right, to, to some extent. <laughs> but, uh, but look, I mean, when you're in that business, then that, that's not really individual create. I mean, there are creators and they're creative powers, but they're also spending millions of dollars per episode to create very high quality premium content. Uh, and I'd say that's different than the space that YouTube has created, which I think has been phenomenal, right? That they've created a space for individual creators to have a voice. Uh, you know, look, the aggregate, it's not like the aggregate time spent on YouTube is, is trumping all of other media. It's huge and growing like crazy. And I think it's an amazing, you know, platform, but it's also not the only platform with which to, to have programming delivered, right? Television still, you know, I mean, YouTube is essentially a cable network. You don't feel like you're fighting a losing battle? I, I don't view them as a, it's not an enemy, one dies, one lives kind of kind of it's thing. Definitely not zero sum. Yeah, it's, 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 yeah exactly. It's, it's not zero sum. It feels like we are consuming more content than ever before. It feels like. Yeah. Don't you sit on the couch with your phone while you watch Absolutely. House of Cards? I'm, I'm like, consuming three streams. Or I'll, I'll give you the, the, the best example we have is sports, right? Where we've made majority of our sports programming available for free online while it's airing on television where we get paid by cable operators and have all these other business models. And the reason we feel comfortable with that is if you, it's best screen available. If you have a 55 inch screen where the, you know, the basketball game is on, you're going to go to the 55 inch screen. You're only gonna to go to the small screen if you happen to be not in your home able to watch it, or if there's some other value that that screen is delivering. Yeah. So when we did the Super Bowl a few years ago, we gave you stats and social and six camera angles, and yeah, okay, we got three million people to do that on top of the 100 million people that watch the game. Those three million people were also watching it on a, you know, maybe a few thousand were not watching it on a big screen, but most of them were. And so our, there's a second screen element to that device, and there's also a first screen element to it. And you have to play sort of correctly in both. And sports just lends itself. You're going to go to the best screen you have available, you know, almost by definition. But how does the cable company feel about that? They don't, they're not losing anything because they're actually getting the viewer to come through their system. So they're okay with it. Yeah, if, you, if, if we were no longer on their cable system and it was just on the phone, do you think that viewer would be like, oh, okay, I guess it's not on my TV today. I'll just watch right. it. No, they want, the, they want, they the want it on the TV. Yeah, so they're yeah. Gonna, that, that's, that's the differentiation. Yeah. And, and you feel like the incumbents like the affiliates and the cable companies are kind of understanding that this is the new world we live in? Yeah, in, certain, in most things, yeah. I mean, we don't put the NFL content that way. We sort of have kept The that. NFL won't do that, will they? Yeah, well, they have it on mobile for a charge. 
Uh, right, Ver you know, I have a deal with Verizon. Verizon, and uh, but but you know, with a lot of other content, we've we've come to an understanding that this is not cannibalizing live viewership. It's right. it's actually probably helping it. Right, yeah. it's either keeping people connected or keeping them connected and keeping the game on longer. Like. If it's a blowout, most people are tuning out. Oh, wait, if there's something more interesting about you the players. You don't think that HBO ran a risk with HBO now going over the top? I think premium is an interesting space. I mean, I used to be at Stars. Uh, we own Showtime at CBS. Uh, premium is one of the most unique spaces where you have an opportunity to grow the business uh, without the buy-through, right? Cable buy-through has been spend 90 bucks to get HBO, not the 15 that it cost. It's the 70 or $80 buy-through you got to go through. In a new world, you don't have to do that buy-through. There's a lot more subs out there for those businesses. They're, they're putting together also, the cable companies are putting together skinnier bundles that also include HBO, right? And they've had skinnier bundles for a very long time, right? I mean, Comcast has had a broadcast-only bundle for a long time. There's a lot of other folks. I mean, I'm not saying, I think there's value in the bundle. I think, that, you know, I subscribe to a big bundle. I like having all that content. There's a lot of people that like that. It's just for those that have held back from subscribing to HBO, Showtime, Stars, you know, you look at the Netflix model and say that's a premium network. It just happens to be you don't have right. to buy through anything to get to it. Right. So right. I think that's that's a big opportunity for premium. Yeah. Vice just did a deal with HBO to do what nightly news. Yeah, we're gonna that's do wild. a daily news show. Why? Because first of all, why did HBO do it? Because that's not their reputation. And why would Vice do it? Well, HBO has well. First of all, I, I guess with John know, Oliver, they're starting to get that uh, that as. A, yeah, and I, you know, Richard Plepler, the CEO of HBO, said, you know, he said that we're not in the news business, we're in the vice business. So, <laughs> that must so have that, made you feel good. <laughs> yeah, warm and fuzzies all over. Um, but, you know, I think that HBO has just been an absolutely incredible partner for us, and they... they Do they see this as a way to get younger people who are not watching TV watching HBO? Well, what I will say is I definitely think that um, there is, you know... There is a real opportunity. There's a moment, and you know I don't need to sort of say anything beyond painting the picture of uh, John Stewart is stepping down from The Daily Show. Yep. Colbert is headed over to yep. CBS. John Oliver is now with HBO. Yep. So there's a real um, there's a real opportunity to um, engage young people in news again. I mean, the thing that has been consistent for us is, um, you know, young people, millennials, are consuming more news than ever before. So they're more engaged with news and more engaged with the world around them. They just are less engaged with the news brands that they've had. Yeah. And, you know, they've, what, what, what we found in not only just talking to them, but in conducting research is we just found that they didn't feel that they were having their voice represented and they wanted transparency, and they wanted to feel like that someone was out there sort of, you know, telling the stories that they want heard in a way that actually resonates with them. And that's just what we've done, and that's what we've done consistently across any category. But our news content has consistently been the most successful content that we've made. And so as a result, we've just looked for ways to help that reach more and more people. And frankly, HBO has been an incredible partner and an incredible platform to help us tell those stories and to tell them without any of the restrictions that we'd normally see elsewhere. How many of you watched Game of Oh, you probably didn't watch Game of Thrones last night because you're all here, right? Yes, we did. You did. <laughs> did you watch it on the cable, HBO Go, or HBO Now? HBO Now? Did anybody watch HBO Now? One person in the back. <laughs> I guess it's not a threat. <laughs> <laughs> How did it work on HBO Now? Was there stuttering? Was, there, was it flawless playback? Because that was one of the concerns, right? And they went to the MLB network and... Wait, I was down in Australia when the iPhone was launched and I was hanging out with some Telstra executives and they pulled out two iPads. One, they put up their server load so they knew how, how uh -huh. hard their servers were being hit. And the other one, they pulled up Australian football and were watching live football on an iPad. <laughs> and I think that's the new world. You know, we, we, we'll bring our own screens right. around and watch wherever we want. I, I was watching TED videos live streaming on my mobile phone, you know, while I was walking around San Francisco. So that's really your job, Mark, is to say, how do we take an existing mainstream media brand and move it into the 21st century? Is that really what you see? I should just rewrite my job description just like that. <laughs> Perfect. Done. Yeah. 
And, and it's a challenge. Can I call myself a futurist? It's interesting, though. Yes, you can. You're a futurist. I love that. Time. It's interesting, though, that CBS did not go the Hulu route. Why was that? Look, I mean, I, w I wasn't at the company when they, they made that, for that decision initially. But Turned out to be the right decision. I absolutely would have, I would have hopefully advised the same thing uh, at the time. I, I think it was a, a smart decision. Uh, and I think, you know, for a number of reasons for CBS, number one television network, whatever it is, you know, uh, nine of the last 11 years or something like that. And, uh, you know, they didn't we, need to. And, and, and frankly, in a joint venture like that, you know, history will say that joint ventures don't always work out that great. Yeah. You know, why are you splitting it evenly when the ratings are not even? Right. You know, and frankly, I think Hulu is interesting because it's essentially taken the network brands off of the shows. And now the shows are branded Hulu. And so if they, if they are never able to monetize the equity of Hulu in, in some interesting way, they've basically just given up their brands. They've destroyed a lot of value. Yeah, I don't know if it's destroyed the value of their brands overall, but it certainly isn't helping their, their brands be aggregators for the future. We view it as the CBS brand will still be an aggregator, you know, like it was 20 years ago, like it is today, like it will be tomorrow. And our goal is to have the experiences be on our platforms or at least via our brand. Right. Uh, as much as possible. It cannot be 100%. You do have to syndicate and distribute, but uh, we really do want to keep that, the brand paramount in people's minds. So if Apple That's TV at some point comes along and starts, you'd put a CBS app on Apple TV happily. You'd put a Vice app on Apple TV happily. We already, we already have a CBS app on iOS and Android. Right. We have a CBS N news channel on right. Apple TV. Is that important to have your yeah. brand, that, that eye on the screen there? Absolutely. Same for Vice? Yeah, um, you know, I, I think that the way that we see it is it's very, very, very important to have your own, you know, a, a vice branded experience across all these platforms. That said, um, you know, we don't necessarily think that that should be the only place the vice content should be available and consumed. Uh, the vice branded ecosystem, our websites, apps, OTT, whatever it may be, definitely need to be the, I like to call it like the safest place to consume Vice, meaning it should feel that everything that you want from us is there, it's nicely organized, it's available, it's personalized, it's everything that you'd ever expect to find from us. In addition to that, there's absolutely nothing that says that, you know, that we wouldn't want audiences to be able to go to different places when they're in different moods and different sort of right. states and different different times in their life and different mental states to say, oh, well, if I go over to YouTube, I want to be able to serendipitously discover Vice content and get lost for an hour, right? right? To be able to go into these different aggregated experiences. But as long as they know that, you know, that, that they don't have to feel kind of lost in the wilderness and kind of searching around for like, well, where is this one thing that I was looking for? If there's always that vice own and operated experience that they can come back to, then I think that we can play in a pretty broad distribution ecosystem. You're going to do a Scobalizer app? I you did. should. I, 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 you know, Facebook set. <laughs> for, for me, you're going to find me on Facebook. Yeah, but you're on somebody else's platform. Yeah, that's, that's where I, I, I can play in a way that the media companies can't because they have to monetize in a different and way. And you're nimble I, enough that if Facebook pulled I want to be a virus on the internet. I yeah. want you to see my content yeah. where you are, right? Yeah. So I, I, I don't want to force you to come out of Facebook or out of Twitter or out of Google Plus to go visit my thing right. somewhere else. I, I want to be where you're at already. If Snapchat's where everybody ends up, I'll be there. You'll too. be there, yeah. Yeah. We got a couple minutes. We're going to ask, uh, let people ask questions. So I want to give you guys uh, a chance to say something. If I haven't asked the right questions, Mark, is there anything you want to talk about, or I don't want to leave you out? We love New Tech's TriCaster. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Well, yeah, definitely. Tim, Tim Jennison's going. <laughs> yeah. I, I, yeah. We all use it, right? Phil's clapping. Over. Yeah. I, yeah. We all use it, right? In yeah. our different different spheres. It's been absolutely amazing for us again like I, I said this before I didn't call it out by name but um, what we're using with talk shows like absolutely amazing just because we can uh, again like skeleton crew right exactly we can, we're producing weekly live shows that we're broadcasting you know across multiple platforms that we can do with four people and you know equipment in the tens of thousands of dollars as opposed to the tens of millions yeah, so it's yeah. pretty nice yeah, my studio at Rackspace is three cameras. It's all run by one guy, Rocky, who helps me. And I'm on air. 
So thank you, thank you, New Trek. For, I mean, that was that kind of video for corporations wasn't really right. possible a, a decade ago. It's right? really in, amazing what digital, the low cost, the rapidly dropping cost of digital technology, the distribution channel the internet provides, just reinvents everything that we do. And what's interesting is to watch a mainstream brand like CBS grapple with it and find a way that works. Uh, watch a new brand dominate by creating something completely unique. And then there's Scobalizer. Well, I want, I want a new tech for this. So in three years, four years, we've got to come back and, you know, uh, my new tech will be able to switch from 360. I really like the idea of immersing the audience. I don't like the idea of wearing a headset at all, but I love the idea of the audience being able to sit at the, in this panel and sit right here and look around. Or sit here. You know, yeah. Something like that. I think that's very interesting. And think about the They'll future see our faces of sports. Up a little for way. sports. You know, it's always frustrating because the camera follows the quarterback. Maybe you want to look at the sa free safety, and this way you could do it. The number one secondary stream uh, uh, when we did the Super Bowl a few years ago was the all-22 camera angle, which is Love the it. coach's angle from above for people that want to watch angle. the whole thing, right? You know? I've always wanted to – so there's two groups. There's one that wants you to switch for them. They watch live. They want you to take care of it. But there is a group of people who say, no, I want to switch the cameras. Yeah. I want control. There's, there's a camera company in Silicon Valley called Jaunt, yep. which has 16 cameras, and they have one that they're working on that has 32 cameras. And the quality of, of their product is really awesome. This is pretty good. I mean, when you when you see a GoPro camera, it's pretty good. But that thing is just stunning. I did the sit. I did the John demo. They had this boxing video I was telling you earlier, and, and it's like you're in the crowd, and I still went like this. Yeah. I'm not even in the boxing. Yeah. You know, you're not even in the in the. Where do you try VR porn? It's amazing. Uh, <laughs> All right, well, you're in the right are, town. <laughs> I don't know. I've been told there are microphones somewhere. I got a friend. <laughs> I got a there's friend. A, there's a microphone there. So if, you, uh, if anybody has a question there. for this great panel, uh, something you'd like to know, step up to the microphone and uh, go ahead and, uh, and uh, ask the question. Or are you the type that just wants to sit there and let us package it for you? Yeah, are you the, the We can talk about drones while people 80% uh, live. That's actually, amazing. She, there's a question. There's, there, uh, All right. Who's, who, the lady. Ladies first. All right. Ladies first. So if you... I'm, I'm just an independent, all by myself, thinking about starting something. So do you have any advice for me? Do it. Yeah. <laughs> um, I started at Microsoft with a $200 camcorder, and I got to 4 million users a month, and, uh, you, which proves you can, uh, if you have access to something that people are interested in, even if it's crappy quality, people will watch it. Um, you know what makes you know, it good quality is passion. Is yeah. your passion for the subject, your enthusiasm for the subject, if you can communicate that, people will overlook a lot of other stuff. That and find a niche that these guys, that all of us ha have right. ignored, you know? Maybe well, there's, there's plenty a, of those. Well, there's plenty of them, but find, find one that you can own and become known as the person of quilting or whatever it is, and uh, it, you'll build a small audience. There, you know, if there's 10,000 people around the world that are into that, they'll start finding you because yeah. of the internet. That, show, show that you care. I think that that's most important because if you don't care, it comes through very, very easily. Oh, yeah. and, and I think that, you know, the internet and the media landscape is big enough for companies of all sizes, it's not zero sum. So just do something that's great, whether it's low quality, high quality, whatever it is. I mean, again, that's, that's, that's what we believe to the core, which is like, if you're not telling an interesting story, people have plenty of other options. So make it interesting and, and you know, give a sh and, and give it, yeah, I, even today I went to the GoPro booth and we went, you know, they're better at stitching than I am. So I learned like four or five things just standing in the booth and talking to people. And it, another guy came up who was also playing with it. And he, he told me some other tricks and said, oh, have you checked this, uh, you know, setting in, uh, in color software that I'm using to stitch this stuff? It's like, wow, it takes time. You know, you, you don't become a CBS overnight. You have to start in your garage. Uh, well, and you, and you may never a, become a CBS, and there's not necessarily anything wrong with that. Yeah. Um, I mean, there's two, th pay there's two payoffs to this. There, there perhaps is a living, but m I think the big payoff for me, and I bet for you too, is the engagement of the audience, the interaction with the audience. Um, it's fun to be creative, right? Yeah, and the creativity you get to You express. know, share it yeah. with five friends. If you yeah. had five people watching you on Meerkat, that's Go for a lot it. of fun. Meerkat's a great opportunity for Or somebody. Periscope, you know, yeah. you guys are in the Periscope. You know, yes, I'm sir. still trying to figure out which one I'm going to use. <laughs> Okay, my name is Pablo. I come from Argentina. By the way, our 3G is 
worse than Venezuela. <laughs> <laughs> but okay, we, we keep working. Um, talking about just uh, uh, Meerkat and Periscope, uh, since you're a futurist and both you too, um, how do you think uh, big uh, companies can use a Meerkat and Periscope in journalism? And also how can uh, they use the, 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 those, uh, those tools uh, when user uses it? So uh, how can uh, big companies can, can get to use the users <laughs> uh, on Meerkat and Periscope? I, I would uh, just caution brands uh, against being too pushy. Sit back and watch, it's, it's sort of participate in this new community. I mean, I, I already have 15,000 followers on Periscope, right? And, and I'm just watching a lot of video. I, 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 I just did my first one a couple days ago. I, I was sitting back and watching rather than being pushy about it because I don't know what the right uh, thing is there. And I was watching what worked and what didn't, and I was taking notes. So that was really interesting. So I, I'm going to maybe use that in the future. I saw, I saw Prep Kitchen on Periscope. Yeah. Which is amazing. See, that's so cool. Yeah, it's just to sit in the back, in, like in just a prep watch. kitchen, and someone brought yeah. out a big hunk of lamb, and they were like, I mean, it was, it was, it was, it's so nice just to see what happens when you let people run yeah. wild. I think that Periscope, Meerkat, either or are going to become increasingly important as yeah. news events happen um, and as people are then able to bring out their camera and broadcast to the world, and as the distribution around you know, hundreds of thousands and millions of live streams simultaneously. I mean, I think that's going to be really, really important. And then I think that, you know, there's going to be a role for the amateur. There's going to be a role for the pro-am. There's going to be a role for the professional media company. Um, and, you know, I, I think that people are just going to bring different value to the platform. And it may be because of their brilliance and their mastery of media. It may be because of their complete ignorance that they're going to actually stumble on something brilliant. So I think that, again, my refrain would just be that the it's big enough for all of us. And so just try and just try and do something interesting. The, the advantage of doing something in the early days of a new platform is you can play around and nobody will whack you too hard. Yeah. If, if in three years you come and start playing around and, be, uh, and doing crappy content in, in Meerkat, people are going to slap you around, uh, uh, particularly if you're a brand, right? Um, because you should know better at that point. Right now, everybody's just playing around, having a little fun, and, and uh, I, I find that refreshing. Right. I think it's interesting also from the social curation aspect, right, where you're, you, you, you have editors and you have editorial people who are like picking, well, let's do more of this or less of this, but they're doing it based on, used to be gut, then it was like ratings one day to the next, now it's like hourly views, pretty soon, now you're talking about instant. Like, you know, is that good or is that How bad? many hearts am I getting? Oh, yeah. Move over. Go to the and you next. see it instantly, right? Uh, if, you, if you really bring your audience in uh, and show them something interesting, you get tons of hearts on Periscope. I think that was, the, that's, I've been trying to figure out what made Meerkat and Periscope so different. Yeah. I think it's that. It's yeah. that instantaneous feedback, which incidentally feeds the, the innate narcissism of these kinds of medias, because you're like, oh, well, it, narcissistic it, feedback. Yeah, group. yeah. You might say it's <laughs> narcissistic, but I, when I was doing it on Saturday, I was getting really interesting questions. I think you, it is you know, exactly right. You know, we've been doing, you were the moderator of my chat room yeah. 20 years ago. We've been doing live chat the with our live streaming. For you were on KGO years. Radio on, KGO. on Saturday and mornings. And right? I've known for 20 years how amazing it is to have an instant feedback loop with your audience. Yeah. It's incredible. It's something... And just the power to democratize that experience, exactly. right? And I yeah. think that you can democratize that experience on any, any level, right? So Meerkat and Periscope are democratizing that from uh, a mobile standpoint, you know, again, to uh, give credit where credit is due to our hosts here at New Tech. I mean, they're absolutely democratizing that yeah. for... Uh, a class of people who may actually use Meerkat and Periscope as a way to discover that they've fallen in love with this and they want to know what they can do next, right? They want to know how they can build the next, you know... And that's the, the when you talk to the investors in Meerkat, I, I, I know Josh Elman who, who invested, that's what I want now. I want a, a better way to discover or share really cool channels with my audience because right now I, I can't find the good content. There is some good content out there. It's hard. It's hard, right? Because you have to flip through 50 channels to find the one that's sort of interesting right now. Right? And by or the way, it might be a fad and be gone in six months, and so what? There's no cost to entry. Not going it's not it may or may not, but but that doesn't matter. That's not really something you need to worry about. No, Let's th take this, a, is, uh, this is this real. Is this is the real deal. Than a fad. Yeah. Next question. 
Hi. Um, yes, so I live and work in Nigeria, in Africa, and hop around different African countries. And I was like, kind of interested in your insights or opinions on how content trends there are kind of catching up. So yes, we're not as developed in many ways, but we're catching up pretty quickly. So this might not be relevant for like CBS, because you know, you don't play in, yeah, you're not, but you should. Um, but anyway, <laughs> I was interested to see what your insights or opinions may be on how our content trends are kind of catching up and how they can plug into some of the stuff that's going on here. I, I don't have a good answer other than I have lots of viewers on YouTube well, and Facebook. Think, think about this. I mean, there is an advantage to co countries that didn't have infrastructure, exactly. cell and phone infrastructure. They could leapfrog uh, the existing inf you know, incumbents. So there's an opportunity. I mean, you've got to get bandwidth, right? Yeah, that, but, and you've got to get devices. But, but once you get to that point, you, the, it's a green field, and the, the opportunities there are huge. Nigeria is one of the largest English-speaking countries in the world. So... The power to distribute content to, you know, these audiences that that want content. Um, it's really just a function of the distribution of the connectivity. So I think video is going to be really interesting. It all depends on the infrastructure investments. I talked to a friend who's now at the Berkman Center at Harvard, uh, studying the future of media in India, which is encountering some some similar challenges. And they actually have a real challenge: one around uh, media and uh, and connectivity, but additionally, India also has a, ma a major challenge around literacy. And so what you're actually finding is because the connectivity and literacy issues that comics are actually a really interesting way to communicate visually and to be able to share information across you know, low bandwidth networks to an illiterate community. So I think that you know, it's the responsibility of media companies everywhere to think about global audiences because they are global and to really take the time to invest in understanding those local markets, to understand how we can actually make sure that we're by the, delivering the right kind of value to those audiences. By the way, uh, Facebook and Google are putting uh, yeah. drones or balloons up uh, over your head. Uh, one of my friends- Astro Teller's project. Yeah, one of my friends said that in three years or four years, we're gonna have global Wi-Fi around the globe, and that'll be a, a very interesting shift in distribution for all of us. Well, and, I, and I think we all think about it now that we have the capability to go direct to that consumer wherever they are, that that does strike a different opportunity than the opportunities of the past 30 years where you've had to go through a local distributor who held the keys to which 10 things got bought and which 40 things didn't. Uh, now I think you have the opportunity to go reach that audience. And so I think for certain areas, even for, for us, it's like, well, certainly going to have that conversation around the news product, right? You know, maybe we won't, our rights are a little bit more encumbered on the on the uh, the sports and entertainment stuff, but areas where we are creating the content 100%, we have a lot of opportunity, you know, to look at that. So I think it's going to be an interesting, you know, sort of five to seven years in that front. We're out of time, but you've been standing there for a while. So let's get one more question and then we'll wrap it up. So this question is directed at Vice, but I think applies to traditional media outlets because they're experimenting in this area. But what are the the lines that are blurring between journalism and documentary filmmaking, and what are the mm. implications, challenges, and opportunities that exist there? That's an awesome question. We should probably talk about it after because I want to talk for too long about it. Uh, but, you know, it, it, it's... You guys are doing films, right? We're doing films. I mean, we take a documentary approach. We take a very immersive, um, you know, first-person sort of empirical storytelling approach to the way that we do news. Um, you know, we didn't call it news when we started. We called it storytelling because what are we doing? We're telling stories about the world around us. And we just really thought that um, a lot of things were interesting. So we put people on planes and sent them there and pointed our cameras and hit record. So, you know, I think that uh, you get more rigorous and you get more disciplined and you get more thorough uh, as you mature. But really, you know, we very publicly went to video production school back in 2006, 2007. And, uh, you know, look at where we are today. So I, I think it's a very iterative approach. And as long as you um, are, and this is true for, you know, I mean, again, the the leanest organization is the organization of one, hopefully, uh, and then you kind of just have to or two or two, <laughs> yeah, and then you just have to sort of find ways to push that forward and and then if you look at what Mark's doing, I mean, Mark is moving continents. You know what I mean? What he's doing with CBS, so it's just taking that discipline. It's never being satisfied with what you have, and it's always knowing that you can be better and having people like Robert here running circles around you and showing you that you have to be. <laughs> yeah, come over to the GoPro booth and watch some of this video, you know, and you, you get, get inspired for the future, right? If there's any lesson, it's that uh, we're in a democracy, a brave new world. We're all starting over. 
and the opportunity is there for you guys. Thank you, you've been a wonderful audience, and thanks to our panelists. Great job, everybody. <laughs> Philip? Let's hear it for Leo, Mark, Sterling, Robert Scoble. And also, I'd like to give a good shout out to Skype and Media for help sponsoring this event for us, and we'd like to, to thank the audience that watched online, and uh, we hope to see you again next year. And speaking of, uh, what'd you say, narcissism, what'd you call it? Yeah. Blatant narcissism or I something. What, yeah. I think we should do a selfie from the stage, <laughs> and everyone stands up and be in the background. So that'll be it. And come on, guys. I'll All right. The awesome there. Are you, are you Ellen? I'm Ellen.